Our first panel on emerging UAS detection and mitigation technologies should be fascinating. So today, I'll introduce uh, our moderator, Captain Eric Herman, dear friend of mine. Eric flies for a large passenger airline and volunteers as a law enforcement officer in the Sheriff's UAS Flight Operations Department in Minnesota. Eric will be the moderator for our first panel as they discuss the complexities of detecting UAS and the mitigation technologies designed to keep aviation more secure for our future. Thank you, Eric. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Unmanned aircraft systems or drones are remotely piloted aircraft without a pilot on board. Over the uh, past few years, the industry and government have been working to safely integrate drones into the national airspace system. For the most part, this has been the prevailing discussion regarding the UAS dilemma. There's been much less discussion about the security aspects, as well as protecting the airspace and protecting airports from individuals who can operate drones with the intent to do harm. Keeping aviation's critical infrastructure secure is an immense challenge. It requires innovative approaches that will need to interoperate with existing aviation technologies. So today we're going to discuss counter UAS mitigation technologies that are being explored to prevent them from flying into the airspace. The panelists with us today are here to discuss the complexity of, the, of counter UAS mitigation. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Tom Hewitt. Mr. Hewitt is the chief of the UAS threat integration cell at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Dr. Mark Lilly, Dr. Lilly is the chief of ISR Systems, First Air Force AF North at Tyndale Air Force Base. Mr. Doug Booth, Mr. Booth is the director of Airborne Electronic Warfare and Cyber for Lockheed Martin. Mr. Stephen A. Alterman, Mr. Alterman is the president of the Cargo Airlines Association and is also the chairman of TSA's Aviation Security Advisory Council. And Mr. Jay Wells, Mr. Wells is a senior attorney for the Airline Pilots Association International. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to you all. Good morning. As will be the format for all our panel discussions today, this discussion will be an informal one. We highly encourage and expect audience participation. We ask that you bring your questions or comments to the floor for our panelists to address. Uh, microphones are being manned in the room, so raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone and get you into our discussion. If you prefer, you can also text your questions to the number provided at your seat. I would now like to ask each panelist to provide their unique perspectives on our subject in turn, after which we'll begin our roundtable discussion. So, Mr. Hewitt, the floor is yours. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, U.S. has come a ways. Uh, I guess we're the first panel here. Usually we're stuffed in a closet somewhere uh, in a back room, so that kind of talks about how much has changed. Uh, thank you again, Captain Herman, for the introduction. And uh, I wanted to do a quick note to thank uh, all of you and all the folks that aren't in this room. I know uh, ALPA has been advocating uh, UAS reporting for its pilots. You know, when you see these things in the airspace, report them to uh, uh, Aviation Tower or what have you. Um, believe me when I say it, I, I know what filing those reports, those types of reports can be like. It feels like you're doing it in a vacuum. Okay, I'm sending this into the air. Is anyone doing anything about it? Sometimes you'll see a very prompt and immediate law enforcement operation. But believe me, there is someone, a few someones in the government that reads every single one of those things and goes through and does the coding and the numbers and the counting to figure out what normal is starting to look like. What does it look like when we uh, establish a policy as we did in 2012 to integrate unmanned systems into the national airspace? And with that, what are the security and safety questions that come along with that? What does normal look like now? This is one of the more, this is, uh, the implementation of the policy was one of the more substantive, if not the most substantive change in the national airspace since possibly its formation to integrate an entirely new type of system for routine sustained operations. Integration is an in-state objective, routine sustained beyond line of sight operation within non-segregated airspace. How long will that take? Well, it probably won't happen tomorrow. It probably won't happen in a couple of years. There will be iterative steps that happen along the way. The FAA's laid out a roadmap, and industry, I think, is somewhat comfortable with uh, that roadmap. I know they'd like to see it move faster, but the next couple of steps will be operations over people, and then after that we'll see operations beyond line of sight. They're authorizing some of those waivers right now, but a couple more are being uh, authorized as we go along. And we'll see those in the industry level for things like energy, natural gas, exploration, media applications. All have uh, their waivers and their permits on file, and uh, yeah, they'd like to actually use that to go beyond the three, 400 feet that they're limited to right now. 
the next step would be autonomous operations and taking man out of the loop. So those types of, so that's what the future roughly looks like. And from that, you can backtrack what would be the regulatory components, what would be the policy components, what would be the technology components of it to make it happen. To find sources for this, you can look as far, you can look simply on uh, patents that these companies are requesting. Things like power use or battery swapping stations or building an infrastructure to support this type of operation. The same way that over the course of many, many years, commercial airspace was developed with radars, fixes, sites, standards, training, airspace worthiness. All of those things are happening within the UAS community, but the expectation is for it to happen in a much more compressed time frame. If we look at two particular points, the legislative pillars, 2012 FAA Modernization Reform Act, national policy to integrate UAS into the airspace with to it and in a manner that would uh, respect the safety and security aspects. 20, 27, 2016, sorry, uh, FAA Safety and Security Act, you began seeing some regulatory pieces that began framing that. So you have $20,000 fine for interference with law enforcement operations. Why? Wildfires out in California were particularly prevalent for firefighters out there in airspace. Sometimes the TFR isn't set up, but if they see a UAS in that operating space, they ground all their systems. Have there been incidents where UAS have interfered with firefighting operations and resulted in possibly additional damage or hindering firefighting operations? Yes, that has happened. Um, these are, so that's just one aspect of the safety considerations. From the security side of it, these are integrated into terrorist and criminal operations. These systems have been integrated into their operations. There are at least two public facing reports of payloads being delivered, California and Arizona. Uh, there is possibly surveillance in that area as well. The surveillance uh, aspect or surveillance tactics is a little bit more opaque when you try to narrow it down because what's the difference between someone recreationally taking a picture of a really cool sunset versus someone filming some sort of activity that may be sensitive or something that you would have an expectation or a normal expectation from a ground-based perspective of privacy. Well, from the ground perspective, it's exactly the same system because they're designed to take pictures. Uh, the smuggling aspect we just addressed, we've also seen a few within prisons in the United States. I believe the numbers live around uh, 15 or so. Uh, see a few more in the UK. Uh, they usually get a report every couple of months of some inmate attempting to deliver small amounts of contraband into prison, prison systems. Uh, disruption, deliberate disruption or harassment of event. Have seen that in places like Belgium during a soccer game where there was a protest, an individual attached a banner, flew through the stadium, wound up disrupting the game, UEFA had to cancel, there was a fight on the field. Uh, have seen a couple of protests here in the states where UAS have, have emerged or appeared. And then finally the one that seems to drive everyone's concern, weaponization or use as a weapon. And that isn't just attaching explosives or some sort of material to the platform. That could be things like deliberately flying it into a target or any kind of malicious use would fall under the heading of weaponization. Bear in mind, that sort of structure, surveillance, smuggling, harassment, and weaponization, those sort of definitions and categorizations within the TAC, within the security space, didn't exist uh, a few years ago. We had never sat down and really wrapped our head around that full spectrum of retail level systems that might be available to a wide population. So we had to really go back and think about it and break just the weapon, weapon, weapon paradigm that can, that can drive discussion. We are in the era of weaponized UAS. Uh, at least the reports from October, uh, open, uh, media accounts discussed affecting of casualties by ISIL operatives in Iraq using a recreational model or small model UAS. It was about the frame we, it was about the size and the frame that we were expecting given the wide availability of the systems out there. Not limited to just the ubiquitous white quadcopter, but some of the more inexpensive fixed wing systems that might be the domain of hobbyists with add-on. Uh, equipment uh, such as you know cameras and uh, different types of uh, RF that might extend the range. So those things are out there. They are being used. If we look back over time, it's possible that use began sometime in the late 2014, early 2015 time range. We began seeing reports from uh, Peshmerga forces and uh, Iraqi National Army of things that appeared to be attempts to use these as some sort of explosive delivery system. But October of last year was kind of the bright line that got drawn. For years, people had talked about using one, but to no effect. And we could go back and pick out various groups, but now it is a reality and it's happened. And that makes it a very, and we've talked about that, when something happens, when something happens. Well, the consideration before was, on the threat perspective, was there, 
but now it is a, a tangible reality. So th with that in mind, you can't rule out use in other domains or crossing over. Another media source that's out there, for folks that really like watching videos and following the news, there was an ammunition factory explosion in the Ukraine. We've seen video of pro or you know, anti-government uh, forces in the Ukraine using UAS for mission planning purposes. Seen the same thing in ISIL as well, so facilitating people and locations. There at least is a media account saying there was an attempt to destroy or affect damage to the ammunition storage point in December 2015. Authorities there are looking into the possibility that may be the case now. So can we, have we confirmed that now? So that paints kind of the security picture of it as far, and broadly speaking, beyond aviation as far as multiple sector, multiple domain. And that's what takes me back around to reporting and why I want to thank people for actually doing things like, yes, filling out these reports in some of the more ponderous terms. Just for full disclosure, I am not a pilot by training or trade. Uh, I have had to learn what I know about it from folks that have gener generously guided me uh, and told me why things like Class B airspace are important, like Alpha members here, because I was like, okay, it's near an airport, but why is that important? And, well, they explained to me in no uncertain terms why it's important. And it was pretty simple. It's like, Tom, do you enjoy landing when you're on an airplane? It's like, well, yeah, I enjoy it very much. So that's why we don't have operations in that airspace. Are there quite a few? Yes. If we looked at the average, if we looked at the numbers and we aggregate them all together, there are various reports out there, various reporting mechanisms out there. Various, some are law enforcement sensitive, some are. But just total numbers looking over the years. Yes, they've increased year over year radically since 2013. 2013, we were into double digit numbers. That's not an accident. When we say, let's go forth and promote use of UAS in the airspace, you would expect to see a jump. So 2014, Insider was like year of the drone. There were a lot of baseline assessments, a lot of baseline language that was put out there to kind of formulate thoughts. A rapid spike by percentage of something like 1,900% year over year, which is a pretty large number. But then it began falling off and it went down to something more reasonable, 200% in 2015, and by 2016 we're back in the 40s. So yes, the raw numbers are going up, but the rate of increase is going down. Now what does that compare to the overall population, one to two million systems out there? It's still in the point zero zero hundred thousandth range by reports. And what do I mean by reports? They are not all near mid-air collision type incidents. And that's a term I wanted to stop and park on for a second. Near mid-air collision, it occurs to me, was probably developed for things like manned airspace separation. So things like Cessnas or beach crafts or wide bodies. Manned aviation. Was it designed, I'll put it to the membership here, was it designed for a two by two, four by four target? Is that sufficient separation from an aircraft for something that's fairly small, light colored lights where you may not have dedicated uh, uh, communications with the operator to actually affect safe separation between aircraft. Uh, I'd leave it to you. We're still using 500 feet for a criteria, so separation events as they occur, yes, there are quite a few out there. Um, I'd have to look at my numbers again. I'll look at them during the, break, uh, during we, during the panel so I don't flip open paper in the middle of all this to see what the percentage looks like. So uh, are they occurring in uh, way too close to airports, yes. One of the ones buried inside of a recent release of FAA data had a UAS report 200 feet below an aircraft, 60 feet lateral over runway 24R in LAX. That's probably a little too close to airport operations to really, to be, to be considered safe. So with all that in mind, we're back to the integration piece and what does normal look like moving forward. That's what we're figuring out. And by figuring out what normal looks like, then we can get into suspicious and indicators and use the data to inform other uh, countermeasure efforts out here and technology development efforts, as well as initial reporting and training requirements, that immediate thing that people actually can do. And with that, I will pass the mic over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is my microphone working? I'm gonna start with my paper open. I hope you don't mind. Thank you, uh, Alpha, for inviting me, and thank you for your introduction. Again, I'm Dr. Mark Lilly. I work for uh, First Air Force, which is obviously under DOD. And we have uh, a couple of unique missions. One of them is Homeland Defense, and the other is Civil Support. If you think of home, uh, Homeland Defense, it's just basically combat operations. If somebody invades California, the East Coast, or Florida, DOD is going to be the lead federal agency, and we're going to, to move to it. So we're really not looking for a lot of permissions from other organizations to conduct our, uh, our mission. The other one is uh, civil support, and under that we have defense support of civil authorities. Uh, we are n not the lead agency. We are supporting, if asked, organizations like uh, DHS or the United States Secret Service, law enforcement in some capacities. 
uh, governors and states uh, whenever they, they need us. Now, there are some challenges to um, counter UAS within the, uh, the DISC mission. Uh, authorities, technological solutions, and some things that are unique to the continental United States. Now, the first question is, is do UASs pose a threat? And again, all of this is open source. It's all unclassified. Uh, they're already being used as offensive weapons overseas, and you can Google that up and see that that's occurring. And it's, uh, uh, if it's a threat over there, then it's a, a threat over here. Uh, now we have uh, three uh, issues under uh, DISCA, four counter UAS uh, authorities, technological solutions, and unique CONUS employment considerations. Uh, under authorities, uh, not to quote law, but uh, 18 U.S. Code, uh, eight, uh, 18 U.S. Code, Section 32, Destruction of Aircraft or Facilities, it's not legal to knock a UAS out of the air. If somebody is flying a small unmanned aircraft system and they're viewing your backyard or your airplane or a facility, you can't just take a bat, knock it out of the air, a shotgun, and shoot it down. That's, uh, it's illegal and there are uh, significant penalties. So we have to have, even as DOD, the legal authority to guard against what might be deemed as hostile unmanned aircraft. After we have the legal authorities, we need uh, DOD policies and higher headquarters directives, all the way down to tactics, techniques, and procedures for countering uh, UASs. Now, some technological solutions that are available, um, frequency interruption, finding the operator. There are some that are already built within the systems, like geofencing and, and uh, TFRs. Uh, however, anything that can be legally um, set up as a barrier can be overcome by uh, hostile acts. Uh, uh, kinetic solutions, uh, you can take control of the airplane, interrupt the frequencies. Uh, however, one of the th points that I want to make is if you take less, like a Super Bowl size event and if somebody's charged with counter UASs, you just can't throw on something that's going to generate a lot of power and take out cell phones and emergency um, response uh, communications. Uh, television transmissions itself, uh, anywhere near an airport, approach departure control. So it's got to fit seamlessly within uh, CONUS, uh, which means you have to have regulatory agency approval, uh, FAA, FCC, possibly even the EPA. So <clears throat> even if you have the authorities and you've come up with a technolog not, not technological solution, You've got to be able to employ it where it's not going to interrupt the communities and organizations uh, around you. So uh, those are basically our challenges. Uh, we're working very hard on it, and we do see some solutions uh, ahead of us. And uh, if there are no other questions, that's basically all I have. Uh, good morning. Uh, Doug Booth from Lockheed Martin. Thanks for uh, having us here on the panel today. Um, fly safe, land soft. Uh, that's at risk. Uh, this threat is real. Uh, we've been working this threat, you know, our, our peers, for uh, some of us almost uh, a dozen years. Um, we've started looking at it internationally from a DOD and Intel uh, perspective, uh, working to develop um, um, ECPs to existing radar system, adjustments to fielded uh, technologies that, that work well overseas, but don't necessarily transfer well to the domestic side. Um, a couple years ago, we started seeing the threat uh, locally here in the U.S. and trying to figure out what's the best uh, path forward. Uh, we've worked uh, with a lot of different agencies. Uh, recently, back from the Nevada test range where we were working with the National uh, Nuclear Security Administration, uh, testing out there for six months um, with Sandia, uh, looking for a solution to protect uh, those types of sites. Uh, the one thing that I'll say that transfers well from the DOD to the civilian world is a, a really good counter UAV defense framework. The uh, detect, decide, defeat uh, framework. Um, if you look at it from that perspective, you can break down uh, the challenges that you're gonna have as an adversary uh, attempts to threat our, our airspace. Um, from a detect perspective, it's not just understanding that there's a piece of plastic flying out there, but what type of plastic is it and potentially, uh, can you track it? From a decide perspective, when these uh, drones, uh, group one and group two drones, are flying from a pop-up perspective, 30 miles an hour, you may only have two to three seconds to decide what you want to do. 
So is it going to be a manual process or an automated uh, process with a lot of security and, and policy uh, to work through? And then from a defeat perspective, it's not just about knocking it down out of the air because you know, not everything is a threat, although we probably, uh, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, look at it from that way. Uh, maybe Alpha and the FAA or maybe even Walt Disney is not looking at it uh, from that perspective. So, you know, can you take control of the drone? Can you spoof the drone? Uh, what are the other ways to deny uh, the, the pilot uh, from getting access to where they want or if the pilot loses access to it? Uh, from a sensor's perspective, under those three uh, frameworks, we've seen a lot of different technologies coming out of industry. Not that uh, Lockheed Martin's the only one developing a lot of peers. Um, from an RF perspective, it works well when there's a communications link, uh, but when there's not, when it's flying autonomously, um, you really have to rely on radar systems, um, imagery systems, um, acoustic systems, but all of them have different ranges. Uh, from a radar perspective, you can really reach out you know, to the you know, 10 to 20 kilometer perspective. From, a, from an imagery perspective, you're talking about a few hundred meters uh, with real clarity. Uh, a lot of different decision software. I think that if you come up with your own algorithm inside of um, ALPA and FAA, it, it's probably going to be something that you continuously work through. Uh, but from a defeat perspective, we're also seeing both the kinetic and non-kinetic. A lot of the end users are looking for something that costs less than uh, $6,000 per shot. So from a kinetic perspective, um, there's not a lot of guided missiles that are in that, that range. Um, but from an EW uh, jamming perspective, uh, from an electromagnetic pulse perspective, those have been extremely uh, functional and consistent. Uh, the, the spoofing and the cyber type connects, they work as well, but it becomes a, a nuclear arms race. You know, I build a counter and then somebody else builds a counter uh, to that. So it's something that I don't think is a long-term solution. Um, we've seen net capture. Uh, where we've tested it, the nets uh, actually don't function real well. Uh, if they're <coughs> flown out of a vehicle, they, they actually uh, turn into parachutes. And so you're not going to get a big range uh, out of that. Some foam bullet uh, technology has worked extremely well. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of diverse solutions. Uh, I believe if you come up with a really good framework that works inside this community, uh, that looks not just from my perspective, you've heard a lot about the security side, but looking at the safety side, I think that you'll have um, uh, some really good results. But you also will have a lot of challenges that we're not seeing overseas. Um, airports are all uh, different uh, from a size perspective. How do you cover uh, the smaller airports versus the larger airports? It's not going to be a one solution uh, fits all. Also from the urban versus rural setup of the different uh, airports, um, when you have a lot of facilities around, it makes it difficult to uh, detect you know, what is really a, a plastic drone versus something else um, uh, flying around or, or even walking around uh, as we've seen in, in a lot of cases. Uh, the biggest thing is there's a lot of communication systems that the um, aircraft have to use. So how do you work um, without jeopardizing any of those? And, and a lot of the overseas systems, uh, there might be some C4 uh, command and control, but you know what frequencies they are, and you've got different time slices of when you can uh, actually jam. Uh, it might be something that you look at uh, from an FAA perspective, or maybe putting counter jam, uh, counter GPS um, uh, systems out there in field. Can you deploy something inside of uh, your, your airplanes um, that uh, react differently to GPS jamming? And, and so I think there are uh, a lot of good solutions if you're following the framework and then you look at it from a safety and, and challenge perspective. I think there'll be a good path uh, forward for this. Good morning. Is the mic working? Good. Um, my name is Steve Alterman. I'm the president of the Cargo Airline Association. I'd like to thank ALPA for inviting me and for holding this, this conference. Um, when you look at the, the agenda, you might ask, what is someone who's the president of the Cargo Airline Association doing on a panel uh, about UAS and counterintelligence message and, and technologies? Um, I asked the same question uh, when I was asked, uh, but I decided to go ahead and do it anyway. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, in addition to my, my day job with the Cargo Airline Association, I also chair the Aviation Security Advisory Committee for, for TSA, so um, I, I've been involved in all aspects of, of security except unmanned systems. Uh, we really haven't gotten into that. And, and when I listen to the presenters before me, I, I think 
one thing is obvious. We've, we've heard from DHS, we've heard from DOD, we've heard from Lockheed about what can be done in terms of some of the technologies to defeat uh, the bad guys in a UAS environment. What all of this tells me is that this industry, the UAS industry, is moving much faster than government bureaucracies can move to deal with the problem. And that, I think, is the major challenge. The challenge is how do we keep up with everything that's going on in the US, UAS environment, and how does the government react? And, and when I say the government, I'm talking broadly. It's not just DHS. It's not just DOD. Uh, the FAA is in the last day of a three-day conference on UASs, which they're holding out in Reston. Yesterday morning was on security of UASs. Uh, there are a whole panoply of government agencies that are involved in the issue of UASs. When we talk about UAS security, the question that immediately comes to mind is who's in charge? Uh, is there intergovernmental coordination? I think one of the biggest problems in an area like this, and maybe it's just me because my idea of technology is turning on a computer and answering Joe DePete's email, uh, but the question is, do we know what we don't know? We know what we know, but do we know what we don't know? And how do we deal with those issues in a government that moves much too slowly when you're dealing with an, an area like UAS? Uh, it, it's it, it's a very complex problem. Uh, you know, the FAA is in charge of integrating the drones into the national airspace system, but you could do that totally successfully and still have security threats up there because people are smart and they can figure out how to integrate and, and, and still provide a, a threat. Um, so does the FAA talk to, to DHS? Does DHS even talk to TSA? Does TSA talk to, the, to DOD? Do any of these people talk to the, um, to the industry, to either the, the, the people like Lockheed, to the, to the operators? Um, I don't even know what the UAS industry is. Our industry is tremendously interested in drones in terms of what they can do in a commercial venture. But I don't think we've ever talked about it in a security context. It's always been a commercial context. The FAA has established a drone advisory committee very good move. It's got all the, the players in, in, the, in the area working together. I, th I think ALPA is part of that. We're part of that. Um, but how does that integrate with what Tom is doing at DHS? What, what, how does it integrate with, with DOD? How do we bring all these things together to try to learn what we know and how to deal with those things? And I think that's a real, that's a real problem. I, I, one analogy I can, I can give is it, it's only recently that the Transportation Security Administration put together a public area security summit. Uh, we've dealt in the past with how to deal with the insider threat, but what do you do in view of Brussels and what do you do in view of Istanbul in the public area where there are all kinds of people involved and you've got to keep it that way because it's the traveling public that goes there. How do you deal with an area that's inherently public uh, it's the same sort of thing in, in, in that public area security summit we're dealing with when you have an incident, who's in charge, what are the lines of communication, how do people react to each other. It, to me, it's the, the exact same type of thing that we've got in the UAS area. Because, you know, and, and I hate to say this, but, but what's going to really cause people to, to get together and figure out the answer to that question of, how do we coordinate who's in charge is when we have an incident. If you look back at the history of aviation, it's always bad things that happen that drive the hard questions. And I hope that doesn't happen here with UASs, but it's sort of the way the industry has worked. So, you know, I, I think that meetings like this are tremendously important so we can all get together and understand what, what the capabilities are in each of our jurisdictions. But the bottom line for the, for the government regulators and the people that have to figure out what to do about this is how do you communicate? I've discovered just from my industry position that half the time, with more than half the time, there's a dispute between government and industry. It's a lack of communication. 
it, it, it's, it's not anything else. So how do, we, how do we keep those lines of communications open, and how do we put a superstructure on there so people aren't working at cross purposes within the government? Who's in charge? How do we do this? And let's get it right from the beginning, because uh, it's not the beginning anymore. I, I, was, I was talking to someone who's intimately involved in the unmanned aircraft systems, and I said, I really need to learn this so five years from now, I'm not five years behind the times. And he looked at me and said, you're already five years behind the times. And he was right. He was right. So how do we, how do we go forward from this time forward to make sure there's safe integration, there are security components, and that we're not working at cross purposes? And I, and I hope that people smarter than me here can, can start answering those questions. Well, good morning. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the legal considerations related to mitigating. So I'm going to concentrate on the security concerns because this is a security conference. So I think we can start for purposes of discussion as to where the law is now looking at the 2016 FAA Reauthorization Act. And there are a couple of interesting components of that act that are directly applicable here today to what we're talking about. So. There was a provision, Section 2202, that required the FAA to collaborate and develop remote identification standards. And this is generally thought of now, I think, as something that possibly the drones would transmit to be able to provide information as to who owned it and who was flying it. Uh, and this addresses some concerns that have been expressed pretty widely about when people see drones, they don't know what it's doing, who owns it, uh, who's responsible, what it's up to, and this is true with law enforcement too. Uh, so another section in that act would be a pilot project for airport safety and uh, airspace hazard mitigation. Uh, under this legislation, six million dollars was appropriated from the FAA Airways Trust Fund uh, to have the FAA mm -hmm. study and develop drone mitigation strategies, how to detect drones at airports. They've conducted activities at the Denver airport. I believe if they haven't started their plans to conduct the activities at the Dallas airport. It's important to note along with this that the FAA's issued a grant assurance letter to the airports indicating that uh, under this program that the only authorized test site for testing drone mitigation strategies is are the airports chosen by uh, the FAA and that would be uh, Denver at this point. And, uh, there's an indication that uh, airports who undertake their own mitigation testing may be in violation of grant assurances. The FAA's letter, uh, and it was issued in October 2016, points out uh, problems that could be associated with airports developing their own testing programs, which would include potential radio frequency interference and also potential violation of federal and state laws. Another section of the recent legislation that's applicable here today is the fixed site facility designation. Uh, this would set forth a uh, process or require the FAA to set forth a process to have uh, fixed site facilities designated. Um, and the assumption, I think, although it's not final yet, is that this would result in the designation of no-fly zones for drones with an exemption process to allow ability for people to operate in these zones. So you're talking about nuclear facilities, utility facilities, and although it's not clear in the statute itself, uh, it's been suggested it could, in, could include airports. Now, those of us that have looked at this area know that people are getting waivers to operate drones in B, C, D, and E airspace now, um, but that's a question that's yet to be determined whether airports, some, some airports could qualify for designation as a fixed site facility under the 2016 Act. There are a couple other interesting provisions in there, one of which requires the FAA to do uh, impact testing with drones. Um, I often think of this as sort of similar to what they do with the engines firing the frozen chicken in there. If you read the statute, it looks like that they will be uh, conducting testing with actual physical uh, testing, probably mathematical modeling to determine what happens with an encounter, physical encounter between a manned aircraft and a drone. One other part to this, I did want to mention, and we talked about this a little bit beforehand, is there has been legislation proposed in 2015, and again in November 2016, that would require DHS in consultation with DOD, DOT, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to develop policies, procedures, and guidelines on how to mitigate the risk of attack 
or, or prevent uh, attacks by small and medium-sized UAS. So that's a policy discussion that's taking place in Congress now. Uh, it's been introduced twice. I'm not sure what the status of the bill is. I presume that uh, it, the, the bill's activity expired with the conclusion of the last legislature, but uh, again, we're in a new congressional session, and that's something that's been submitted twice. So consideration of uh, that type of step is, would be uh, good to consider in a discussion like this. I think a couple of the other panelists, um, Mark and Tom, touched on the legal definition of drones as an aircraft. Uh, there was a case at the NTSB, and then that was clarified in the 2012 FAA Act. Um, so drones are a legal aircraft. Most of us in the room know that. But I'd like to talk a little bit about low-altitude airspace rights. It's a little bit of a gray area right now. And one of the questions is, what's the legal right of the landowner? as with regard to the low altitude airspace. We have a history of Supreme Court cases and the Cosby and Griggs cases are two cases you hear cited where it was held that uh, the landowner does have rights and those rights would be uh, rights to be free from nuisance and it's been declared a taking with low altitude overflights. But uh, it's a little bit up in the air. So what about shooting down a drone in your backyard? Mark, I guess you, you mentioned one of those. Well, we got a case last week, um, and news report, a uh, decision by Judge Thomas B. Russell, senior judge in uh, U.S. District Court in Kentucky. Federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit brought against William Meredith, the Kentucky man who shot down a drone that Meredith believed was flying over his own property in 2015. During the weeks that followed the incident, Meredith dubbed himself the drone slayer, Later, he sold orange T-shirts with that phrase printed on them. <laughs> so, and here's, here's a picture on the internet news article of uh, Meredith sitting there with a shotgun reclining in his backyard. And uh, here's the opinion by Judge Russell. He, he dismissed the suit as a, quote, garden variety state tort. No federal jurisdiction over that lawsuit. He noted that uh, while the drone pilot or operator had brought the suit asking him to declare that it was an aircraft, that it was operating in navigable airspace, that that was not necessary to the resolution of the dispute. Ultimately, it was a garden variety claim for um, property damage, damage to the drone, or trespass, and those were the issues to be determined. Now, he did notice that the federal interest was not completely absent, but he held it was Whatever it was, it was tangential to the claims between the parties. He knew the FAA was not there. The FAA was not bringing regulatory action against either for or against either of the parties. That the FAA was not seeking a declaration of navigable airspace, nor was the FAA prosecuting anyone for destruction of an aircraft. So, in this case, at least, uh, the case is dismissed. So, this was only decided uh, about a week ago. So, presumably, it could still be appealed, but. Uh, his decision goes on for some 15 pages. It's pretty well crafted, in my opinion, from a legal standpoint. Um, and you know, the people who do want to pursue this area of the law, if they're interested in getting this uh, line of reasoning reversed, they might want to pick another case. So we'll see whether this case is appealed or not. Well, moving back to the uh, drone mitigation technology on airport facilities, from a legal standpoint, I think it matters who owns the facility, and who owns the technology that's being deployed. So what if a non-federally owned airport, just to simplify it, were to deploy and use a counter drone system today? Now we know that the FAA's got the grant assurance letter out there saying you can't do it. Um, to summarize, and this has been touched on I think by all of our speakers to some degree, to summarize the counter drone technologies that are out there, you can identify and intercept the operator, handcuff them can target the drone, find it and jam it, target and destroy it, or target it and take it over. Sometimes these technologies, people have referred to them as hackers, jammers, and destroyers. Um, well, you can run into some legal problems, and that's alluded to in the FAA's grant assurance letter. Um, there's criminal liability, as was mentioned, for destruction of aircraft, and you can face up to $250,000 in 20 years in prison. There's also authority uh, that would criminalize interference with aircraft. 
Under state or local law, there can be liability for intentionally damaging or tampering with the aircraft or damage or destruction with property, as we just saw in the Boggs case in Kentucky. Common law tort liability for property damage and personal injury. And liability for interfering with the signal. While we're talking about FA and DHS potential jurisdiction over these drone activities, remember that the FCC regulates spectrum. So there's criminal liability potentially under the Federal Wiretap Act or similar state laws, civil fines or potential criminal liability under the FCC Act to jam or interfere with wireless communications, felony potentially under state statutes for accessing, hacking, altering, access, damaging, or destroying computer systems or software without permission. I think these concepts among lawyers at least are pretty, pretty mainstream in the drone area at this point. Uh, they've been discussed. Um, then you've got to consider what if the technology doesn't work or it causes damage to other persons or property and you've deployed it. So tort liability or even product liability uh, might apply if in case of negligence or product design. Well, one possible safe harbor, which hasn't been widely discussed, is there was a uh, provision in the 2002 DHS Act uh, called the Safety Act, and you can find this easily online, the DHS Safety Act, and it allows a safe harbor for anti-terrorism technologies. Um, and the purpose of that was to promote the development and deployment of anti-terrorism technologies by uh, limiting liability limitations for qualified anti-terrorism technology. Uh, what's qualified anti-terrorism technology? Well, you apply to DHS and they qualify it. Regulations were promulgated under this statute. They became final in 2016. Uh, I know a number of manufacturers have pursued uh, certification under that. So uh, while we'll see what happens with the development of these technologies, that's one potential area uh, that could provide a safe harbor. So in sum, I think taking this into consideration and all the uh, very much on point comments of the panel here, uh, you know, there's a need for a policy debate in how the security considerations play into the integration of UAS. I think there's a recognition that uh, these security considerations should take place in parallel uh, with the integration of UAS. Some have even suggested they should precede it. Um, and any deployment plans of the technologies are, in addition to the safety review, or would need a, a security and a legal review. Those are my comments. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is that we know from the FAA they estimate there's 2.5 million drones in the United States as of 2016. 2020, they're estimating up to 7 million drones in the United States. So from the safety perspective, uh, that's an immense challenge that we're looking at and meeting. And that's why Apple maintains if the aircraft's going to fly in the national airspace, safety standards should meet or standards should be set to meet equivalent safety to the airliners flying in the airspace. On the security side of the house, it's slightly different. So I'd like just each panelist to maybe touch on, and we've heard a little bit from each one of you, what do you think is the most pressing issue from a security standpoint that needs immediate attention? One of the interesting things about drone slash UAS as the regulation moves forward, much like cyber is the way that this is a integration forcing function the, what I mean by that is you have a lot of the interagency groups getting together and various questions and working groups, not just in the national level but at the international level as people try to find the legitimate space for UAS. Uh, many countries have went ahead and embarked on this idea of integrating UAS into their airspace for legitimate applications. And I haven't run across any country yet that has the tiger by the tail on that thing. What does it look, what does full integration look like and what are the steps that are occurring along the way? Similar safety issues, similar security issues, similar issues with registration. I would say probably for me, at least from this end, the most pressing is why is loss of control with these systems being experienced? I know it seems like a small question, but why is loss of control being experienced? Is there something larger in the airspace or is it simply a function of inexperienced users that are working with a very deceptively simple system and not cognizant of the airspace routines? I know that sounds like a minor thing, but it's a tangible first step. The idea of the broad sweeping, big box solutions, multiple layered integration, laws and policy, yes, those are components of it, but if I had a what could I answer first, why is that happening? because that question to me answers a lot of the safety and security questions as far as the speed of the policy moving forward. 
I think what keeps uh, most of us, uh, people that I work with, up late at night is, uh, is the current threat that we're looking at right now. A small UAS with a small payload that can be absolutely deadly, and anybody who's ever seen or worked with C4 knows it doesn't take much against a high value target, be it a civil 747 or 757 full of passengers, or even on the ramp, flying it into the intake of an engine and exploding it. The amount of damage it, uh, it can do in property and cost and life, uh, as well as some of the airplanes that the uh, military flies, those things are unbelievably expensive. And uh, I fear that, that they're, they're vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, the most pressing need is that you, you, you must decipher that there are uh, individuals out there with intent to cause harm versus an individual, a hobbyist, uh, that, that loses control of their aircraft. I think when you lose control of the aircraft, the chances of it hitting a plane versus hitting a building or just you know, flying and running out of battery um, are limited. But when you talk about someone with the intent to, to destroy or, or cause destruction, um, your risk assessment raises in, uh, considerably. Um, so I think that is the, the number one thing that we have to get through and start developing policies um, and laws uh, around protecting our civil airspace. We all take for granted that we can go jump on the plane, uh, fly where, anywhere we want, um, and everything's going to work. But when you have a threat going after um, you know, that, that plane or that infrastructure, um, it, it definitely is a, a big cause of concern. Yeah, I, I, I would agree 100% with that, that assessment. Um, one of the things we've discovered in the area of security in the, in the cargo area, and I think also in the passenger airline area, is, is that one of the big gaps is the intelligence piece of it. What do we know, who knows it, and how do we share it? How do we share it among government agencies? How do we share it between the government and the private sector? Um, one of the keys to stopping bad things happening in the security area is knowing what the threats are. And I, I would say, you know, it, it, it's pervasive all through the, the security paradigm, whether it be in the passenger airline environment, whether it be threats to the cargo airline environment. And I, and I would posit that it, it, it also goes to the UAS environment. Who knows what? in terms of intelligence. And if you know it over here, but the guy over here who could do something about it doesn't know about it, that's a real threat. I think we have to develop a system in this area as well as the other areas. It, and we've moved a long way in the area of, of the security of airplanes, but we haven't really touched on it in the area of UAS. Who has what intelligence what are the mechanisms for sharing that intelligence between government departments, and how does that get to the people on the ground who could do something about it if they knew about it? And I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're going to have in the UAS area, because I don't mean to insult anybody, but everyone sort of is jealous of their own fiefdoms, and they don't share very well. And in this area, when we're talking about security, we need to figure out some way so that there is a sharing of the intelligence among government officials so that the government generically knows what's going on, and then figuring out a way to transmit that to the people who could do something about it on the ground. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're going to have. Personally, I agree with Steve and Doug. Our biggest challenge is a lack of clarity and, and thought uh, on policy on how we're going to deal with these threats. Uh, at a government interagency level and across our industry. If I could, if I could follow up. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about technologies and, and sensors in the field and countermeasures, but we do need to share intelligence and work left of that sensor. If, if we're at the point where we're sitting at the airport and we're waiting for someone to hit a button to protect, um, there's a lot that can happen before that. We can disrupt their network. We can. Uh, find out about their supply chain, and it is in, in intelligence sharing and sharing with FBI and, and local forces um, to take care of that. So I would say that, 
your, your risk of success improves if you look left of you know, that defense framework and what can you do uh, against adversaries there. So we've kind of identified uh, two threat vectors. One would be the unintentional flight into the airspace or into an airliner by maybe an operator who's lives close to the airport and, and young and doesn't know the unintended consequence. So we've talked about the aircraft failing and potentially losing link or flying back to home potentially into the way of an airliner or those that just aren't educated enough to know what airspace they're in. Then we've looked at the potential weaponization of a drone and using it as uh, something to cause harm. So maybe Dr. Lilly or Mr. Booth, you can address, is there one mitigation system that's being developed or looked at that can handle both threats that we're looking at? Can we go first? Um, well, I, is there one? I, I think there's a, a great number of systems. Um, the, and you've got a kind of, uh, I guess, how to fight in two different perspectives. One is OCONUS or out of the continental United States for DOD, where the Army goes in or the Navy's out at sea and they're in charge and they take over. When the Army goes in and sets up a base, they don't need authorities and permissions. They're already there, they already have their mission and, and implementing systems that counter UASs, which they already have, uh, is not a problem. Um, the Army has a program of record where they have multiple systems uh, that work very well uh, overseas, but those are really not applicable in the continental United States. We are having to walk a very fine line of what we employ, and that's being both developed by uh, industry as well as, um, by way of example, the Air Force Research Laboratory is developing systems, uh, but we almost have to cherry pick what we can do. Um, detecting, tracking, and identifying is all fine and legal when it comes to mitigating <laughs> that's uh, kind of a different story. So here in the continental United States, we're looking for systems that will be approved by the FAA and, and the FCC and that will not disrupt other organizations. So uh, there's one in particular, it, uh, I'm not gonna mention it, but you can look at it in open sources that uh, electronically will detect systems and it's kind of a spiral development where the next phase is to go in and see if they can't take control of the UAS. Of course, we're, we're now ahead of the authorities, but we hope that those will come along shortly. So there are systems out there. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot. and we, We've been to a dozen of um, exercises at different test range. Um, even when you go out to these test range, when you're working with uh, some of the civilian agencies like NNSA, you can't apply all your effects. So you can't apply your, your GPS effect. Um, so I, I think the ones that we have seen that are consistent are the ones that have a multispectral front end that aren't just relying on, uh, our, on RF, uh, because not all the drones use RF. When they fly autonomously, um, you're gonna have to rely on, on other measures like a radar. Um, uh, from a technology roadmap perspective, the drones, and we, we talked about the increase of, of sales of drones, um, but their, their technology is just gonna get even more superior. They're gonna fly faster, uh, they're gonna fly uh, higher, um, and they're gonna fly uh, using uh, visual imagery uh, from the ground that you can pre-program. So then there's not much coming off the plane. It's, it's extremely passive. Uh, so you, you have to continue to develop the sensors on the front end. Um, and, and then on the, on the countermeasures, uh, I think that I've seen a slew of, of ones that work fairly well. Uh, the jamming works the best um, from what we've seen. You know, I'm talking non-kinetically. Um, non-kinetic, the, the jamming uh, definitely um, is something that you can consistently apply. Um, you can work it omnidirectional, you can work it directional, uh, depending on what's around. And um, um, I, I believe that the countermeasures from a cyber spoofing is, is something that we've implemented as well, uh, not just Lockheed Martin, but other companies. Uh, but it's something that can be countered. When you're talking about a real-time countermeasure, it's great if you have the countermeasure working today, um, but once your adversary knows you know, how his, his drone was defeated, he can develop a counter to that. So it just becomes an arms race, and how do you keep up with that? So uh, if you're looking for something that's a real safety net, um, electromagnetic pulse, you know, close proximity uh, works well. It works well against drone, uh, uh, swarms of drones. Uh, and we've seen that one um, equipped on a uh, interceptor drone uh, flying in. Uh, but they all don't work well in the aviation uh, community. I think you're going to have to pick, um, you know, some, some scenarios to, to work through there. Yep. Just to inform some of these efforts you had mentioned, 
operations near airports. So what's near an airport? Most people thumbnail is five miles, five miles for recreational or standard five miles or classed airspace for commercial users, the two different flavors of UAS users out there. But looking at the numbers uh, for 2016 back to 2014 in class B airspace, our average encounters are 3.31 miles in 2016, 4.9 miles in 2015, 4.6 miles in 2014. Overall across all airspace classes are 5.88 miles in 2016, 6 miles in 2015, and 6.8 miles in 2014. So where are these? Five miles may be useful, but what if classed airspace extends beyond, or there are different classed airspaces beyond that, which is where most of the sightings are occurring during those terminal phases of flight, landing or takeoff. While we're sitting here compiling numbers and counting across all of these multiple domains, not just what you're providing and as consolidated by FAA, but law enforcement, DOD, uh, park service, uh, various other entities out there, what does the whole picture look like? How many of these things are happening out there, and what kind of data can we actually work off of so that we can inform the RDTNE efforts that are out there? Uh, saying blindly to go forth with very little or you know fuzzy data, go forth and build and do. We've seen that before. We have seen that before. And uh, for me, we're back to that original question that I was kind of alluding to. Reporting, point of fact. Give me data on this that I can actually metric and put together and exactly what you were saying with intel sharing and collaboration and reports. What does a whole of government picture look, what does the whole nation picture look like for UAS? Both to, because, both to support the integration policy, but to address the clear safety and security issues that are out there as well. So, I drive by. The question is how you answer that, that question. And that goes back to who's in charge. Um, and I don't want to insult anybody, actually I do, but. <laughs> Uh, um, and I probably will because I haven't yet. Um, and, and that's it. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question yet. Um, everybody is working within their own sphere of, of influence. And, and you know, I, I know that with this administration, the last thing they want is more regulations and more government involvement and things. But somebody's got to take charge of this whole thing to make sure that everyone's working in a coordinated effort and collaboratively rather than just by themselves because something is going to slip through the cracks unless we get a hold of this thing. The Air Force, uh, Air Force Material Command just had that rose pinned on them within the last few months. So, you know, this has kind of been an ongoing problem for a number of years and we have just now designated a lead organization to pick up the mantle for counter UAS. Yeah, and my support function within the DHS universe. I, I was kind of an early arrival here from the threat perspective uh, when a question got asked in 2012, what does the threat environment look like to support the 2012 FAA Modernization Reform Act and integration? Over time, in, in the past uh, two years, DHS s and is now the counter UAS lead for the department. So in essence, I work for them. I support their activities within the framework of the department. Within the larger information requirements, I've got lots of different customers out there, whether that's RDT&E, whether that's local law enforcement that are developing practical protective measures. And to be honest, that's where I've focused a lot of my particular efforts, that practical magic stuff. I know the big box solution, the can of drone be gone, those are going to be tougher to suss out. There'll be elements of acquisition, procurement, operational environments that all have to be addressed. We can't trade off the communications domain in the name of the UAS domain. I'm going to accidentally take out spectrum if I do this, so maybe that would be a balancing act. So those initial things, those, those practical, simple things as far as planning on the ground for fixed site or uh, area security events, what does recognition look like, what do these typically look like, direction, uh, identification, reporting procedures and processes, uh, high risk or a plan, uh, risk risk and threat planning prior to an event, high risk launch locations, likely launch locations, those practical things so that when pilots report to tower and they notify law enforcement, that law enforcement get to the right place. We're doing like this two vector thing where I see this five miles off here and I'm landing, okay, I have to bring an asset in and I'm looking in this broad area for person on the ground. No, this is not a great procedure, but this is the one that exists today. So this is the reality of the day. Does that mean it's going to stay static over time? No. But, and it does have to get better. But for now, that's what we're working with. Eric, if I could expand on something that was mentioned earlier. And uh, 
it's a, another potential threat area, and we discussed this a little bit uh, in the conference, uh, prior to the conference ahead of time, and I understand it may not be considered a legal threat, but it's reconnaissance and surveillance by an illicit organization. I mean, some of these uh, drones that are having traffic encounters in airports, you know, we don't know why they're there. Um, and I think when we're seeing with sophisticated non-state actors and so forth, it's probably reasonable to assume that they're going to conduct some type of reconnaissance and surveillance if they're going to do some sort of bad act. So maybe we could get a little bit of commentary that might inform the audience here on uh, what the view of the agencies is as to whether uh, illicit uh, reconnaissance and surveillance is considered a threat and, and how the agencies deal with that. Well, for DOD, they, they've specifically come out in uh, memorandums and said that surveillance alone does not constitute a threat. And they uh, said you have to kind of take um, the totalitary, is that the word? To totality. I, I, I feared I was going to have to say that word in this conference. All of the circumstances involved uh, to determine whether or not it's, a, it, it's actually a threat. So just somebody looking at you for DOD right now doesn't constitute a threat. It's perfectly legal, even if they're using a UAS inside or outside or within the defense line of the installation. So. Talk a little and that includes military and little bases? Military bases. Uh, just like uh, the civilians, the base commanders don't own the airspace above their installation, and they're trying to change that. And I know the FAA is coming up with TFRs for um, a lot of military installations. Uh, I'm not really sure. They, they, they quoted 133. I'm not sure what all those sites are, uh, are exactly. But um, base commanders don't own the airspace above their, their installations. Coast Guard and Federal Protective Service within DHS identified the issues pertaining to surveillance with U.S. pretty early on. And the stubborn question domestically is, what is the difference between standing on a public sidewalk with a camera, happily shooting photos all day long, or sitting on Gravelly Point and taking pictures all the live long day or flying? I know there's an altitude piece, an airspace piece, but if it's, but usually privacy is, it's like if you don't want us to see it, do a better job of, you know, not exposing it to the public. So the expectations of privacy begin to fall. How does that, uh, how is that addressed when you have an aerial platform that's looking down past a barrier in, as you mentioned, publicly available airspace? Well, it's publicly accessible airspace. And you must want people to see it because it's on overhead imagery that's commercially available. So you don't have an expectation of privacy. So there's no hit there. Now, there are states out there that are passing laws pertaining to privacy, and they can enforce within the public safety rubric. And this is where we talked about the multiple parts all moving at the same time. Airspace safety, compliance and enforcement, FAA. Public safety, public safety issues could be local, state, local law enforcement that work up thousands of counties, municipalities, and states. So you have privacy laws that are already in place. Can you hover outside of a window and take a picture of someone inside their house? Well, in most cases they will say no, or they'll say at least close your blinds. So the privacy rules and expectations there, those have been codified in some states. Now there's concern on the legitimate user industry because of the network and patchwork of state, local, federal, or state, local laws that have been put in place for the purpose of public safety. And each one of those are slightly different. Some call for restrictions on air flight uh, uh, operations over airports or critical infrastructure as defined by the state and at the federal level, uh, power lines, people, sporting events, prisons, and the like. You could go through it. There's about 20 pages of these. Uh, legislative, uh, I believe, State Legislator Association has a pretty good website. But if you really want to get local on it, you've got to drill into each one of those municipalities and see what local ordinances they passed. So as you said, with privacy, they, they'll, there are some very prohibitive rules out there that we'll leave to the courts, because I'm not a lawyer. But at least the municipality passed, you cannot take photos without someone's consent. <laughs> so that's going to be an interesting, but it was identified early on a, as an issue and where are the enforcement touchstones that either are already resident that we can leverage or uh, do we have to identify something new? By way of example, every airplane that takes off and lands out of Milden Hall, England is photographed. These people have a hobby. They actually moved the fence to give these people a place to park to take pictures of all the airplanes. It's their hobby. Every airplane that takes off and lands. I leave uh, Europe, I come back to, uh, through the United States to Atlanta, and they're the same people are taking pictures of every airplane that takes off and lands out of Atlanta. Same, same individual. So you're, you're right. People have an inherent right to take photographs and to look. And that kind of leads into another question I have as the guy sitting in the seat. We have 54,000 pilots at Alpha. Not everyone flies within the continental United States. 
So is there mitigation technologies being looked at and we fly into potentially hostile countries um, that maybe in relation to the airliner would be able to detect and defeat a drone because we don't have time and our speeds to determine what that threat is. Is there any technologies being looked at in that regard? I can only say that they are deploying systems overseas to, to counter UASs. And if, uh, you know, airliners are flying in and out of those facilities, then most likely there are, are counter UASs. Just like they have counter IEDs when I was in Afghanistan. They're in large boxes, you turn it on, and zeroes out everybody's cell phones. So that's basically all I have. I don't Something really know like much more than that. An example I know publicly mentioned media, you know, flying in Israel and ben Gurion. Of course, they have a slightly different security environment there. They have they had thousands of incidents of low altitude, medium ballistic systems, and they have employed kinetic ADA to deal with and mitigate that. Uh, that environment may not be resident in other parts of the world. Uh, it isn't. So when you go into it, you might have different airspace standards or requirements. Some countries are completely no. They're like, we don't want them in the air, don't fly, it's just a criminal activity period. Others, Canada, UK, Europe, Japan, uh, Asia, Australia, those places, they're trying to integrate these things because there is a, there's a tangible business that's being developed. There's a real business here that's being developed. So they're promoting that. So they are wrestling with the same balancing of safety, security, new policy regulation that we are. I mean, I, I have seen, and I have seen the pictures of eagles in Belgium and France. Please stop sending me the emails of the eagles. I, I appreciate it. Well, they'll go up and train them to go up and snatch a drone uh, near their airports and some of their critical sites in France. That is one thing that's out there. I'm not saying that advocately, but just one of the many array of systems that could be employed. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot over in, in Europe. Um, up in Canada, uh, there's been some, some efforts up there. Uh, the one interesting thing was we were recently contacted by a, a USTSA agent wanting us to go overseas and help at an installation over there. Um, and we started talking a little bit about the domestic side. and, and um, they said that there's more of a threat overseas right now than there is domestically, so that's how uh, they started to prioritize. So I think that the U.S. is, is, is next, but there are some, some decent solutions overseas. On the, on the practical magic side, TransCanada has a fantastic reporting website. It's pretty transparent. Uh, CAD or us, you can just go in there and search all day long, and they will have some follow-up. UK, uh, UK Proximity Board does pretty good work. I appreciate their language in the proximity board reports where they go back and do the formal board investigations of reported near mid-air collisions. In the initial reporting we see, it's usually like there was no conflict, aircraft landed without incident, there was no conflict, aircraft landed without incident, and occasionally you'll get divert or forced to divert or change course. That same language might be initially reported in the UK, but they'll go in and follow it up with a statement after investigation and all the interviews. That Plat these platforms were too close for safety purposes. They violated safety and separation issues, and they're very clear about that in there. The pilot was able to react and mitigate to his training and his experience, but nonetheless, those two, you know, that, that unmanned system and that aircraft should not have been in that airspace, but the pilot did everything they could to mitigate it. That's very precise language, and that's something that I'd like to bring out a little bit more with some of these reports, so it's not, they landed without incident, they landed without incident, there's nothing to see here, they landed without incident. I think if you're filing a report, there's a reason you're filing a report on this stuff. And I'll ask the panel, what type of time frame do you see to implement these mitigation systems that are being looked at within the civilian sector? You know, I've been doing this job for, I don't know, about 14 years, if you include my military time, about eight years as a civilian, and hasn't been a lot of movement, but there's been a lot of effort. I think things here, as far as authorities go, um, on Capitol Hill move rather slowly, so uh, I don't see it happening with the next, you know, 12 months, but based on the language that was put in the NDAA 17 and what they're anticipating it being in 18, hopefully within the next year we'll have the authorities to to mitigate and very shortly, if not almost immediately, we'll have systems that will allow us to, to do whatever those authorities will allow. Yeah, my, my guess is um, if you look at the DOD and the threat, um, they were talking about it, you know, many, many years ago and started deploying systems and upgrading systems uh, two to three years ago and it has really increased uh, from a spending and deployment perspective over the last six months. Um, so I'm going to say that um, the, the domestic side, the aviation side, is probably, you know, we're talking about it now, so you're about where, you, where the DOD was two and a half to three years ago. Uh, you'll probably see a slow ramp up, but it's going to be over two years before you really start, my perspective, uh, before you start seeing a, a, a real good policy put out there, a decent framework, and, 
and a lot of uh, rollout to the different airports. Unless we have an incident. And of course, and that drives uh, change across the board. The FAA was given 18 months uh, after implementation of the 2016 Act to test those technologies and report back to Congress. And, and they had pretty specific, uh, and it, so we put, put it about the first of the year uh, in 2018. And they had pretty specific reporting requirements. They report the, in each case of the system tested, the number of drones detected, the number of successful mitigations, and, and other metrics. And that's due in Congress in about another year. If everyone's shy, but I haven't seen anybody raise their hand yet, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, uh, there's a microphone around right there, sir, that you can stand on. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name's Rob Hickey. I'm from DHS Science and Technology. A uh, couple of quick questions. Number one, um, has anybody done any research on uh, mid-air collisions with UAVs? And what I'm getting at here is getting an aircraft in the same plane of motion with lead on another airplane isn't all that simple, having done it on a number of occasions. Um, and I'd love to see a report on what we really project the mid-air collision potential to be with UAVs and commercial airplanes. That, that, that I would find very, very interesting. The second question I've got, and uh, Stephen, you and Doug touched on it a moment ago. Um, prior to coming over and working for DHS, I was the deputy for the Air Domain Intelligence Integration Element. And one of the things that I was trying to do over there was to figure out within the intelligence community what level of collection and analysis that we had concerning aviation specifically. What uh, outside of the uh, FBI that is going to be legal and, and have that pretty well tied down because it will pertain to an on, uh, ongoing investigation. What do you see as, as the collection and analysis function in order to be able to provide us that information or that intel that needs to be as far left to boom as we can get? There is one working group. Um, I'm not going to publicly announce, you know, what the working group is, where they do collect um, both international and domestic incidents and share the data. I believe there's 60 agencies on this um, this working group, uh, and the information has helped prioritize uh, which agencies are going out to the ranges faster, uh, which agencies are looking for solutions that are required next month. So um, they have seen threats here domestically. Uh, I believe the FBI is on that working group. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure, and you know, we talked about the working group earlier, uh, what it is, but uh, um, I'm not sure how that information is getting shared with, uh, with FAA or TSA. Yeah, it's sort of a vice versa thing. And what you talked about, I mean, on the reporting aspect of it, I think we might have talked on the phone once before. I, I think yeah. we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, so I, I think that goes to is there, because there are so many different entities now that are reporting, uh, I know uh, the lion's share would come out of FAA pilot consolidated reporting, but what about all of these other domains out there? That consolidation knitting together, yeah, we're trying to put it together, but is there a one database to unite them all, magic pile of data? No. No. Now, I do have some, but uh, to, to your point, yes, that was some of the spinoff, and that's my little corner of it within the larger framework of the aforementioned working group, the space I particularly identified inside of that early on was, how do I serve and classified customer sets? And what can we do with this data because it informs a lot of different customers? All those po policy decisions are well and good, but when you put a price tag against a policy decision, people want to see the math. <laughs> and right now, we don't have great math. I've got some, it's not great numbers because there are more of, but as a percentage, Numbers seem to be going down as a percentage overall reporting on total population, but there are so many gaps or flaw, there are so many, there's so much wiggle in the total population of UAS, so that's where there's a lot of variance on this. But I can say this, in circa 2012, when I went back and looked through everything I could find on UAS and aircraft, the number was just about zero. Yes, AMA and the modeling advocacy, advocacy groups were right out there. They don't bother aircraft, they generally stay away from them. There might be airspace domain awareness reporting. I can't explain the 2,000 plus we're looking at just for aircraft this year. Well, I can't explain it. I can explain it really well. 
we are integrating UAS into the national airspace, and there is a very distinct market for these systems and a growing and expanding recreational field as, as well as an expanding and evolving commercial subset within, a, within that. Within that. Well, on, on the first question, I, I did mention, of course, the FAA having the authority to do the uh, collision testing. And, and based upon my recollection of the statutory language, it's not existing research, but it does appear to be broad enough to permit flight testing. So if you wanted to suggest that to them, I suppose that's a possible avenue. I think the Air Force has done a little flight testing in that area. I'm not advocating people go read reports just for fun on nights and weekends, but if you look at the pile and stack, there are a couple of reported but unconfirmed collisions that are out there. Leading edge, general aircraft, damage to wing or leading surfaces, unconfirmed, much like every other darn one out there. Uh, we have not had that smoking gun, that was drone, that was aircraft, but we've had a lot of reports that are probably likely, maybe, can't be explained by biological because there's no blood or feathers. Bridger, you had a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, Bridger, I'm an engineer in air safety. Uh, with small UAS, how do you think that the lack of any type of certification standards for the technologies that are on small UAS are contributing to the security problem when you talk about lost link and uh, these aircraft flying you know, uh, into unauthorized areas? That was a, there was a subtle point I brought out. But and I know it wasn't the big sweeping thing that keeps me up at night. Lots of things keep me up at night, mostly drinking coffee, a coffee after 8 o'clock. Um, but uh, uh, why that? Because it is emblematic of what we don't know. So if I'm going to classify something as an aircraft, well, I mean, my personal take on it is, look, if I've got to put a license plate on my car, then put a number on your aircraft. You have to do it, whether you're general or professional. I need to see some number on the outside of that aircraft if we're going to play aircraft to aircraft rules. If we're going to integrate, and the objective is sustained routine, autonomous, beyond line of sight operation for commercial purposes and recreational purposes, there should be a guarantee. And as a practical matter for the UAS industry, both the makers and the users of these systems, that there is not going to be erroneous interference, that there's not RF interference, that there's not some sort of link or loss. I don't want to find out way after the fact that, yeah, during sunspots and on Tuesdays, these things have a tendency to just wander away from their pre-planned flight route. I really don't want to find that out after we've said, go forth and fly beyond line of sight. And right now, I think, the hobbyists and users are being somewhat generous about it. When we read their initial report from law, from law enforcement, I lost control of this system. I lost control of this system. One day they're simply going to say, that system stopped responding to my commands because of some sort of interference that, you know, that so we can at least attribute why these are occurring. The Australians have actually raised this publicly as a question. They have a sheet of reporting on it and actually did a really good report. We're not sure why they're getting away, but it'll answer a lot of the safety questions. As a follow-up, I think I saw a report by 2024, this is going to be an $80 billion market. So we should be uh, talking with that industry. They should be putting tail numbers on their, on their vehicles to help uh, control. And when we're trying to make a decision, um, it's easier to decide if, if something's beaconing versus not beaconing, you know, how do I react or how do I, how do I act? So I do think that there needs to be some meetings with this industry to get a little bit of control around it to help us so that we're not spending you know, an equal amount of money securing you know, all of our facilities, uh, you know, all of our stadiums, and all of our airports. Well, gentlemen, let me thank you uh, for participating today on our panel. I'd like to thank the audience for the few questions we had this morning. And I hope everyone found the conversation useful, educational, and relevant to the job we do each and every day. So thank you, gentlemen. Sure. Well, like